Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, it's a blessing to have you with us. We always get excited uh, when uh, men and women of God uh, get together uh, to uh, talk and to share and to learn and to grow and to uh, advance the kingdom of God together. Uh, this is the Douglas Leadership Institute's uh, monthly uh, leaders meeting. And although this call is hosted by the Douglas Leadership Institute, it's in partnership with our sister organization, the Frederick Douglass Foundation. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, our dear friend, Catherine Davis, who's the founder and president of the Restoration Project and a partner of um, the Douglas Leadership Institute to give an opening prayer and then I'll come back and share a few more introductory uh, remarks. Catherine. Father, we just thank you um, for this opportunity to come before your throne. Um, we invite you into this meeting, Lord God. We ask you to cover this meeting. Let only those things which will glorify and edify you be spoken. We thank you for our special guest, uh, Benjamin Watson, Lord God. He's a man of God who has stood sometimes alone, standing for the lives of, of the defenseless, the lives of those who can't speak for themselves. And we thank you for his life. We thank you for his stand. We thank you for his family, that he is living out, Lord God, what it means to be a man of God in this hour. We ask that you would bless this meeting and bless all of the attendees. We also ask a special blessing, Lord God, for the young basketball player whose knee was blown out and people are saying it was because he stood for you. Father, show yourself real in his situation and bring speedy healing beyond what any of those who are criticizing and ridiculing him could think. We thank you for this time and we bless your holy name. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Catherine. Really appreciate that. Again, um, welcome to uh, this month's um, Douglas Leadership Institute uh, Leaders Meeting. Uh, in conjunction with our sister organization, uh, the Frederick Douglass Foundation. Uh, my name is Pastor Arnold Colbreth. Uh, many of you I haven't had the privilege of, uh, of getting to know yet, but I'm looking forward to getting to know you and many others uh, I do know. Uh, I have the privilege of serving as the Director of Ministry Engagement with the Douglass Leadership Institute. And uh, part of my, my role in that assignment is networking and building organizational relationships with senior pastors and ministry leaders to advance the mission and vision of Douglas Leadership Institute. So in that capacity, I serve as the chief engagement officer uh, for ministry leaders. That being said, um, I have included in the chat feature uh, at the bottom of your screen a digital contact form that uh, if you haven't already filled that out and, and you're not already in the Douglas Leadership Institute database, uh, I would, um, we would love for you to do that. Uh, what that does is uh, it allows us to keep you abreast of what we're up to and uh, you partner with us to influence the culture and advance the kingdom of God together. Uh, the Douglas Leadership Institute, uh, you'll hear me refer to it as DLI, is a national uh, education and public policy 501c3 organization with representatives and groups across the United States. Uh, DLI's philosophy is based upon the sanctity of human life, the promotion of free market principles, and limited government. Uh, founded in 2015, DLI is the brainchild of Pastor Dean Nelson, who serves as chairman of the Douglas Leadership Institute and also the chairman of the Douglas Leadership Institute. Uh, he's a minister and a veteran political and pro-life leader. Through his years of working with African-American churches and advocacy for biblical worldview in the marketplace, it became clear that there was a need to uh, 
bridge the gap between um, African American faith based institutions, um, civil government, and the civic world. So DLI was created to develop a network of faith based leaders across the nation and provide them with uniquely tailored programs, information, and social networking that will engage, equip, and empower men and women of faith. So the men and women of faith need to not only take positions of leadership and prominence in our cities and businesses, but to also come equipped uh, with biblical worldview values to shape and influence policy in our nation. Our mission is to educate, equip, and empower faith-based leaders to embrace and apply biblical principles to life and in the marketplace. Um, and it's interesting when I'm talking to leaders on a regular basis, many of them will say, well, you know, don't all leaders have a biblical worldview? And of course, those of us on this call know that uh, they don't. <laughs> so that's part of our mission and mandate to help um, fill that, uh, that gap. Um, our vision statement is a nation of prosperous, flourishing communities transformed by men and women who embrace a biblical worldview in culture and civic engagement. Uh, the Douglas Lee Institute is based on the core values of integrity, justice, virtue, transparency, respect, and responsibility. We, uh, we have a three-pronged approach to what we do. Uh, strengthening the Black family, uh, supporting criminal justice reform, and securing educational and economic opportunity. And even though I said strengthening the Black family as one of our primary targets, we work with people of, of, of all goodwill. Uh, so it's not like we won't, won't work with other groups as well, because we do. Um, we have, and we will continue to do so. But as we talk about uh, securing um, economic opportunities, uh, you'll remember the Paycheck Protection Program that uh, was implemented uh, at the beginning of the uh, coronavirus pandemic, helping uh, churches and ministries and organizations, uh, nonprofit groups to, to uh, get funds to continue to uh, to, to operate in a fisc fiscally sound uh, manner. And uh, Douglas Leadership Institute, we were right there uh, in that first wave uh, working with uh, probably 300 uh, organizations and, and churches to secure uh, over $3 million. Well, as I'm sure you may know, there's been a second wave uh, of that Paycheck Protection Program uh, funding and the federal government has extended the, uh, the PPP application deadline until August 8th. So with over $100 billion still available to small businesses, churches, community organizations, and individual contractors, the Douglas Leadership Institute has partnered with MBE Capital to, uh, to get the much needed funds to those um, organizations in need. Uh, MBE is, is capitalized by legendary basketball great uh, Irvin Magic Johnson, and the group's mission is to assist Black and minority firms to participate in the program. You heard me say that August 8th uh, is the deadline, so, so there's still some time. So in the chat feature at the bottom when I'm finished talking, I'm going to put the link there if there's anybody that still needs uh, to access uh, and, and get assistance uh, with those forms. Lastly, uh, with those funds, excuse me, I said forms, with those funds. Uh, just a, a handful of uh, ways to stay connected to DLI when you uh, put your information in our uh, database is a weekly newsletter. Uh, we have weekly prayer calls every Sunday evening at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern time. We'll get you that, uh, those call-in credentials weekly uh, pastors and leaders virtual roundtables every Thursday and Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, that's an opportunity to get a deeper dive into who DLI is and kick the tires, look under the hood, and, and we dig a little deeper. We have this monthly call the first Tuesday of every month. And this monthly call is typically at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern time, but we shifted it to 7.30 p.m. to accommodate um, our very exciting 
uh, special guest tonight, uh, Mr. Benjamin Watson. And, uh, and, and as I talked about my desire and my, my responsibility to connect with those of you, we'd love to have ongoing dialogue with you about ways of partnering in your city and in your state to help strengthen the work of your hands to uh, advance the mission and vision of um, Douglas Leadership Institute and to impact the world for the Lord together. So uh, with all that being said, um, I'm going to yield the floor to our chairman, uh, my dear friend, uh, Pastor Dean Nelson, and be on the lookout in the chat section because I'm gonna give you um, the link to the PPP for those that need it. Dean. Excellent. Thank you so much, Reverend Calworth, and thank all of you for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, greatly appreciate uh, seeing many of you that are on with us. Uh, as some of you may see me on the screen, may recognize that during this COVID-19 pandemic that uh, I am trying to become Frederick Douglass. Uh, I have not had a haircut in a little while, but uh, I promise you that uh, we are going to uh, this evening have a, have a great evening despite uh, the fact that I have a, a new look. Um, thank you so much uh, for uh, Catherine Davis for your prayers a little bit earlier. And uh, tonight we just uh, are really, really honored to be able to have uh, Benjamin Watson to be on uh, with us. We're going to get right into it because uh, I, as I was texting uh, yesterday with my brother, who is a, a football coach and avid player who can't be on tonight, he was uh, remarking of how uh, he was sad that he couldn't be on because he said one of his most favorite football players uh, and particularly in the position of tight end was Benjamin Watson. So we are really honored uh, not just to have a football player, but to have somebody who is dedicated to God and also is uh, willing to uh, share his gifts and talents uh, with the world uh, for God's purposes and for God's glory. So uh, what I would love to do now is just to go ahead and to introduce um, formally uh, Benjamin and then uh, we're just gonna begin to have a fantastic conversation. Thanks all of you who are on. Uh, there's still some additional room uh, if people want to uh, invite others to join us. This is uh, gonna be a fantastic evening. Benjamin Watson played 16 seasons in the NFL and was a dominant force in New England Patriots and won a championship ring in Super Bowl, uh, what's that, 34, no, 39, okay. <laughs> Roman numerals, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly challenged. Okay, uh, however, uh, one of Benjamin's greatest passions in life is to protect the lives of the most defenseless. As one of the most outspoken pro-life voices in the media, Watson and his wife, uh, Kirsten, personally devoted their time and their money to assist pregnancy resource centers. He has also addressed the March for Life, which takes place every year in Washington, D.C., and has participated in DLI's Sudden Uprising Forum in 2020 earlier this year. Uh, this year, uh, Ben will star in Divided Hearts of America, a movie uh, that is, excuse me, a moving pro-life film that is being produced by himself alongside many notable pro-life advocates such as Alveda King, uh, Ben Carson, and Abby Johnson. Benjamin and his wife also are the founders of One More, a nonprofit organization dedicated to impacting the lives of those in need by providing enriching enrichment opportunities and promoting education through charitable initiatives and partnerships. Uh, ben, thank you so very much for being with us tonight. And uh, I'm just going to uh, start by saying uh, to everybody that's on, uh, actually just a little over a week ago, uh, we had the opportunity to uh, be together on Fox News uh, talking about uh, the sanctity of life uh, issue, uh, which we'll get into. Uh, tonight, we hope to talk a little bit of everything ranging from uh, faith, uh, family, and football. But uh, Ben, uh, thank you so much for joining the uh, Frederick Douglass Foundation and the Douglass Leadership Institute family. And uh, just tell us a little bit about how you got involved or embarked on uh, being an advocate for righteousness and justice. And uh, just take a little bit of opportunity to introduce yourself. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Thank you for moving, um, you know, the program back a little bit. Uh, with these seven kids I got, you know, we had to be flexible. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't do the Zoom call in the middle of dinner. So 
Uh, we had to move it back. The kids were upstairs um, asking me when I'm going to get done. I said, I'm going to go give you a kiss when we get done with the interview about 830. So uh, mm -hmm. I appreciate you all being flexible. Um, <clears throat> it is an honor to be on this call with you. I have great respect for DLI and also uh, Reverend Nelson, who I've known for uh, several years now. Um, seems like our paths cross a lot of times in D.C. or I'll see him with Human Coalition or something like that. Uh, we did have a great opportunity to speak about the sanctity of life a couple weeks ago on the national stage. But uh, being someone who um, is, is someone who stands for justice and righteousness and, and loves the, the, the connection between the two, uh, what you all are doing, um, standing for the black family, um, advocating for uh, education, integrity, all those things is vitally needed in our communities, especially for our young people. Um, there are so many role models that our young people can look up to. Um, obviously their parents is the first line. I always say, you know, I'll have a parent come up to me and say, you know, could you tell little Johnny to go to school? I'm like, no, you need to tell Johnny to go to school. That's your job <laughs> as his father, you tell him. And so what you're doing is enriching and empowering and equipping um, parents as well to, to be that for their children. So I, I appreciate um, and I've learned already in my short time with DLI, as we mentioned earlier um, this year, I, I've really learned a lot to expand my my palette, my repertoire, my understanding of, of how we can um, civically engage in a responsible manner that is not only powerful and needed, but also uh, responsible to the Lord and is from a biblical worldview, because that is how we must continue to operate. We cannot operate um, in this secular realm as everyone else does. We are called to be ambassadors of Christ and we are called to still be in the world, but not of the world. And so while we're in the world, we need to do everything with our, in our possibility to spread the love of Christ by advocating for the voices. And for me, it was always um, part of life growing up. I grew up in Norfolk, Virginia, um, not too far from DC. My mother's actually from the district. Um, <laughs> yep, my, my parents met at University of Maryland where my father played football from 74 to 78. Uh -oh. And then moved back home, <laughs> then moved back down to Norfolk. And so growing up in my household, um, I, I learned early on about, number one, the importance of a relationship with Jesus Christ, but also number two, how you walk that out in a practical manner on a daily basis. And, um, you know, how we got involved with this is amazing. When you simply speak truth, nothing profound, nothing amazing, people hear that and people gravitate toward that. Um, so there's nothing spectacular that my wife or I did, although we, we did try to be intentional with how we supported pregnancy centers. But for us, this issue of um, the unborn is just one on a large um, string of other justice issues. Uh, I cannot be someone who stands for, against injustice, uh, the injustice of racism, but also when I stand against the injustice of the most vulnerable among us, which is the preborn. And so I see them all together. And really that comes from um, you know, being a believer and understanding uh, the love that Christ has and that we see in scripture how he takes care of the widows and the oppressed, those people matter to him. So I think they should matter to us as well. Amen. Man, this is, uh, this is great. Now, I, I want to go into this direction a little bit. Um, while many professional <laughs> athletes are careful about their public image uh, and they don't want to address controversial issues, um, you did. And is it, is it simply because you're a Christian? Cause you have Christians uh, NFL and other places that are willing to say that they're Christians, you know, they're talk about being blessed, but not all of them are willing to take on, um, difficult mm -hmm. subject matter issues like this. Why, why, why did you decide to do this? How, why, why did Ben Watson want to zero in on this issue? Um, I I think that, you know, athletes, athletes are people too. <laughs> and so we have the same uh, fears, the same um, uncertainty, the fear of being hypocritical uh, that anybody else does. We all have a sphere of influence. Obviously for a professional athlete, that sphere may be a little bit bigger, may cast a wider net, but all of us struggle with the same um, doubts, uh, maybe the same feeling of being uh, ill-equipped to speak about certain things. Um, so that's no different whether you're in, in professional sports or you're out of professional sports. And so largely, I would say for the early part of my career, um, I was not as outspoken about these things, mainly because I was just trying to make the team. 
<laughs> and so <laughs> and so my focus was on thing. okay you need to catch the ball you need to block you need to be on time you need to do those things and so i'm just trying to to to, to get in where i fit in and to, to make a team and to stay in the league and so i would say the latter half of my career um and the latter half is eight years um but really I think there's been an increased sense of urgency for me and my wife over the last five or so years. Um, I can remember very vividly, I was, this is about 20, 2014 or so, and I was reading through the book of Jeremiah. And there's a verse, Jeremiah chapter 9, 23 and 24, you probably know it, but it says, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast of his might, let not the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for I delight in these things. And I sat there and thought about that verse. And I said, man, you know, what type of an impact do I want to leave in the years I have left in this league? What type of an impact do I want to leave in the years I have left on this earth? How do I want to influence people? And I said, look, if we can stand as a family for, for kindness, for justice, for righteousness, because the Lord delights in those things. Let's do it. And ironically, you know, when we, we had our first child, so I said we have seven. Our oldest is 11. So we got, awesome. it's crazy. It's crazy That's around awesome. here. We got, we, awesome. got 11, we got 11, yes, 10, uh, 8, 7, soon to be five. And we got uh, identical twin boys that are one. And so I remember when we had our first child, Grace. This was back in 2009. And we went to go get a 3D ultrasound. And I remember sitting there and you could see she yawned in utero. And I like caught the yawn. I yawned mm. too at the same time. It was crazy. Wow. Wow. First kid. And so we leave there. I remember my wife saying, again, this is 2009. She said, you know, one day I'd like to have, you know, an ultrasound business so that, you know, pregnant women could see their, their babies if they're not able to afford to do so. Wow. Filed that away. Fast forward six, seven years later we are in touch with a couple other organizations that were actually um, providing ultrasound units for pregnancy centers. And it just clicked. So we got on board, started funding ultrasound units in different places. So we placed about three of them so far in different cities where we live. But I say all that to say that God will provide an opportunity for you to serve at the proper time when you have the proper desire to do so. And so you may have a desire in your heart to get engaged with something. And it may take a year, two years, three years. And at the proper time, he'll have an intersection of your desire and somebody else's need and someone else's provision to meet that need. And they all come together. And so that's what happened for us specifically when it came to this issue um, several years ago. And so we started doing that. And then, you know, as you mentioned, Reverend Nelson, you know, you don't see too many football players that get involved with this. We all love getting involved with the, the social justice, the racism, which is, is very needed. I wrote a book about that. But this is something I believe that is important too. And so I say all that to say, we all have our, our fears. And I'd be lying if I said, you know what, I don't care what anybody says, I'm going to say this. And when they're mad at me and call me names, it doesn't bother me. Yes, it bothers me. Um, it bothers all of us. Uh, but we answer to a higher standard. And when we have a mission on our life for a specific time, um, the goal and the encouragement I've received from believers and like-minded people has been to keep on going and well-doing um, no matter what others may say. Man, that is fantastic. If you're just joining, uh, this is the Douglas Leadership Institute's monthly Leaders for Life call. And uh, we actually have a great guest, uh, Benjamin Watson, uh, ben, before we go to uh, the other issues of football and uh, some other stuff, um, you have a new uh, documentary that you're working on. Uh, I believe it's Divided Hearts of America. Uh, tell us a little bit about that project as much as you'd like and uh, kind of what, what was the impetus behind uh, this project? Yeah, I'm excited about uh, this is a documentary, a full length documentary, uh, my first involvement in any film. Um, and we just got news today. We're going to release digitally. We wanted to do the theater thing, but with COVID, don't know how it's going to work. So our first release is going to be digital. So we'll get you information about that um, coming up in September. And so um, the impetus would, would be maybe a year and a half, almost two years ago, uh, with the Reproductive Health Act in New York. And if you can remember, uh, when the governor there 
Uh, they enacted the Reproductive Health Act and then immediately kind of set off a domino effect. Or really the first part of it was um, the confirmation of, of, of Kavanaugh and Gorsuch and then the Reproductive Health Act. And then you get the more conservative laws in places like Alabama and, and Georgia. And you see, we saw this ramping up of kind of a preparation for some sort of Supreme Court showdown, um, which which almost happened, but but hasn't quite happened yet to the to the extent that many people are thinking that it would. And so, I was kind of struck by that. But then also, I can remember when um, great Governor uh, Northam in in my home state of the Commonwealth. <laughs> you know, made his comments about, you know, a baby being born and then being kept comfortable and that sort of thing. And, you know, there was an outrage over that. Um, and so those events made me say, you know, okay, we're already involved in this. What's something else that I could do to bring, to bring civility, first of all, to the conversation? Obviously, I come from a place where I believe that there's uh, Imago Day, that there is sanctity of life, in all stages of life, from conception to the grave, but also understand that many people feel vehemently differently. How can we have this conversation without um, condemning or vilifying people we don't agree with? Mm -hmm. um, and so I went on a journey and the film is really about my journey, trying to hear from different voices. We went to Chicago and New York and uh, New Orleans and, and Boston and the district, we were there as well, um, speaking to people on Capitol Hill, um, people in legislation, people that are in medicine, um, people that are pro-choice, people that would say they're pro-life, um, and in between, and kind of getting to the bottom of where we are right now as a country. We're clearly divided. How can we get out of this as believers? How do we engage with people that we think are the other side? How can we see their humanity but really, we are at a very, very critical time when it comes to this issue specifically. Um, this is an evil that lurks beneath the surface that a lot of people don't want to talk about, but we need to talk about it, especially in light of several other justice movements that are happening right now. So yeah, the film is Divided Hearts of America. As I said before, I, I interviewed several people you may know, you mentioned some, um, Dr. Carson, um, I, I, I interviewed people who survived abortions. Um, one lady survived an, abor an abortion, if you can believe that. And I wrote mm -hmm. people who were who were um, a production of, of rape, which is a lot of times the caveat. Wanted to hear from them. Wanted to hear from men and women, um, and just hear hear really the, their experiences when it came to that. So, really enlightening, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm excited to release it in a couple months. Wow. Well, man, it is a very important subject matter to, uh, to, to be had uh, in terms of that conversation. And I know that from my own experience, um, even though if you watch, you know, CN, uh, you know, CNN or Fox News, you would think that, uh, you know, we're really, really polarized. But when you really start talking to people, I think across the country, you really recognize that, you know, they the average person, they, they may not be as far apart as, uh, as you know, some of the cable networks would try to make us think. And uh, I'm so grateful that you have taken um, just this kind of common sense uh, approach to bringing at least this discussion to, uh, to America, man. Thank you so much. And if there's any way that we can uh, use our voice and our network of pastors and leaders and uh, doctors, attorneys around the country, uh, it, it would be our privilege to help you in any way that we can. Well, I greatly appreciate that. And, and I think you're right. Um, the tribalism sells when it comes to entertainment, when it comes to news. And really, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of ignorance. And I mean that by saying a lot of people don't know, you know, the history of abortion. I wanted to find out for myself the history. How do, how do we get here specifically? What laws were put in place 20 years ago, 30 years ago, how did this thing ramp up? What happens? So a lot of people just don't know. We see the tip of the iceberg and it can polarize us, but a lot of people don't know all the factors that led to us being where we are. And you're right. Um, you know, there's a lot of nuance in there. You know, the, 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 the polls show that a lot, of course you have some people that say, Hey, pro-choice, no matter what, pro-life, no matter what, but there's a lot of gray and there's a lot of people, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of uh, complexity in how people feel about this topic. 
Well, look, man, we are going to uh, shift gears a little bit to something that's a little, uh, little lighter. And so I want to ask you this, you know, I, I lived in Virginia, uh, grew up, you know, went to UVA. So when you made that Maryland comment, I see uh, Gerard Henry, who's on with us, who will uh, be able to ask a question. He'll probably have something to say about uh, the UVA. I wanted to go to UVA, though. You know, <laughs> I wanted to... I'm gonna let you ask your question, but I'm gonna say no, this. no. Uh, well, look, so, we, look, we so, might have we might have to have a conversation later. I wanted on. to go to UVA, <laughs> but they wouldn't call me back. I oh, sent them film. Man. That, I sent them everything, man. They wouldn't call me back. See, all right, all right. I'm not gonna go. I'm not gonna go off on on UVA right now because there's a lot that I could say. But I I love my time there. But look. I went though, I moved to Georgia and I used to do campus ministry at the University of Georgia for a while okay. while we were there. Uh, I have, uh, of course, now I live in Maryland just outside of DC. And these are all places that you have lived. But look, I know we got people all on the, on the line from all around and you know, this will be viewed by people all around the country, but tell us one or two places that you live that you felt like were your favorite spots uh, and, and why. Ugh, you gonna get me in trouble. Um, <laughs> but I, but I'll say that I, I have I have positive things to say about everywhere. But I'm not gonna go that route. Although I do have very positive things to say. Even Cleveland, we had three babies in Cleveland. We were there for three years, had three wow. babies. So, wow. Hey, there's some in the water in Cuyahoga County, or there's not <laughs> much to do in Cuyahoga County. One or the other. Um, New Orleans was a favorite for the family. I will say New Orleans is when our kids got just old enough to be involved in school. We were in a local church family. I would say that was when we had more friends outside of the game. And so it was the first time we really, you know, felt like we were part of a community there. I had been involved in a lot of things, um, you know, getting to know the city from a criminal justice standpoint. Um, there was a voting act that we were involved with there, um, it, different charitable initiatives. I mean, it was, it, was, it was a good place. But then the biggest thing was, so when I got the call to go to New Orleans, so my wife's family's from Louisiana, um, full stop. And when I called her telling her, hey, I think we're going to New Orleans, it was, we're going to have some great date nights. Because <laughs> if you've been in New Orleans, the food is amazing. You can go an entire year and not repeat the same place. And so for us who like to go out and eat, uh, you know, New Orleans, I would say, was a special place for sure. Um, secondly, I, I would say, you know, being being in Baltimore also was great because I was only there for two years, but so much history there. Like I was telling my daughters that I was doing this thing for the Frederick Douglass, and they were like, "Hold on, we learned about him, and we went to Harriet Tubman's house in Maryland." And so the history there, as well as being the you know, proximity to D.C. and being involved with those things, um, we enjoyed that as well. Man, uh, look, that's a great, great segue on two ways. Um, you know, I obviously am a huge fan of Frederick Douglass and uh, living here now in Maryland. Growing up in Virginia, you never think about like going to Maryland, but uh, the Lord had other plans. And so uh, one of the great uh, quotes from Frederick Douglass is it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And the next guest that we have who's going to uh, ask a question is Gerard Henry, who uh, went to the University of Maryland and has been a, a great friend for a long time, formerly of uh, BET. Uh, Gerard, uh, I think the floor is yours for your question. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Ben, for sharing your time with us. This has been awesome. A question I, I had for you, I'm next to my son, who's Benjamin Jeremiah, by the way. Uh, just, just, just coming off the football field here in Alpharetta, Georgia, which is why we're here. Come here real quick. Hurry up, hurry up. His little brother, who had to tag along, was upset because I didn't speak about <laughs> Mrs. Brendan. Um, but the question I had for you was about fatherhood. And just I'm curious to hear about your perspective as an uh, African-American Christian father. What do you feel like are some of the challenges or unique challenges that you face and that we face different from fathers in general? Because obviously fatherhood is, is critical, as you alluded to earlier. Yeah, yeah. And um, <clears throat> we're going to be down there in Georgia in about a year. We're actually going to be moving to Georgia um, outside Atlanta. So I had to catch you when we're down there. Um, but yes, fatherhood in general is difficult. Um, there are certain stereotypes about fathers in general. When you watch uh, uh, comic shows or, or comedies, when you watch movies, the father is aloof. He don't know what's going on. He sits on a couch. He's lazy or he's super... Um, aggressive. It's always these crazy things 
with dads. Now, multiply that when you talk about a father whose ethnicity is African American. That's multiplied. And so the idea is, oh, you're you're a father and your skin is brown? Man, I didn't think they made y'all. And so and so and so we come back where statistics actually show that yes, we are not married as often as our white counterparts. But studies show that black fathers are involved, mm-hmm. even when they're not. Um, and so we combat the idea that we are non-existent or that we are, that we don't care. And so we feel like we have to fight against that on top of being black and going out and getting a job and going out and getting a loan and going out and driving and all the sorts of things that we also deal with in general. And so there are some unique challenges, but what I've, what I've, I've found, you know, being in the NFL for 16 years, obviously I'm in, I'm in a unique place where I'm around 60, 70 guys every single year, many of them are, are black. Um, and so many of them want to be good dads. We have to tell the stories that we want to be good dads. We may not have had a father that showed us what to do. Some of us have, but whether we've had one or not, I find so many young men that want to do this thing right. I've had conversations. I remember sitting in, in Cleveland, Ohio, about to go out for a game, and a guy's girlfriend just went into labor. Like, he wasn't expecting it. So we're warming up in the locker room, stretching, because it was raining outside. And he's on FaceTime, and his girlfriend is giving birth. Now, it killed him. But he said, man, I always want to be there for this kid. And they're about to get married, I think, in in a few months or so. But I say all that to say that, you know, we have to show manhood and fatherhood in a positive light. And we do that first by our example. And we do it secondly by how we speak to young men like Benjamin sitting beside you because he's watching everything that you do. And whether you had, Ger- Gerard had a father or not, I don't know. But it doesn't matter. We can break the chain no matter we, whether we had a dad or not. And Absolutely. so he's going to go on after seeing your example and seeing the fact that he's there that you're there with him and he's going to replicate that for his kids. And also he's going to give other kids who may not have had a father, he's going to give them hope. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, our, we have great challenges. I I think in general in this country, when it comes to being black in America that we all know, and we all talk about ad nauseum that are very, very real. Um, When it comes to fatherhood, it's even worse, but I think that's why it's more important for us to live this thing out, to fight through it, and to encourage other men that they have what it takes. Guys just want to know, do I have what it takes? Mm-hmm. The guys who are fathers, the men on this call, the other men that you're in contact with, tell them, you have what it takes. And not only do you have what it takes, but we need you to step into the role that God has called you to be in. Awesome. Appreciate it. Fantastic. Appreciate it. Um, Ben, you uh, last week uh, did something that was very kind to me uh, when we were texting. You uh, you offered a prayer, actually, for uh, somebody that's really special to me as we talk about fathers. And so uh, my daughter, Michaela, uh, is on. Uh, I shared a little bit with you, and she was in a uh, recovery process. But um, she actually is uh, not just a D1 uh, athlete, but also uh, saw a tweet uh, from you, uh, I think, earlier this week or last week. So I'll, I'll let Michaela uh, come on as a uh, PAC 12 uh, rep and uh, <laughs> ask her question. Michaela, the floor is yours. Thanks. Um, yeah, I was looking at uh, one of the tweets you uh, put out last week about um, the PAC 12 players who are kind of getting together and deciding whether or not they're going to play next year. Um, and sorry, one second. Um, and I just wanted to get your thoughts. I saw you tweeted, um, in times of uncertainty, I'm glad to see this generation of players advocating for themselves, their families, and their livelihood. Um, I think as someone who uh, played in college, you know kind of the dynamics there can be um, a bit interesting. So I just wanted to hear a little bit more um, about your perspective on that. How are you feeling? How you how you feeling? You doing good? I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, I started walking um, Saturday, and I had a post op appointment today, so all oh good. <laughs> I was telling your dad, I was like, I've been there with those knees, um, you know, in my own way, and so 
definitely praying for you to get better. I know how tough it is to be away from what you want to do. So that's that's tough. But appreciate I appreciate the you. question. I appreciate that. For sure. Um, you know, for those of you that don't know, uh, the, the athletes in the pack um, are – they actually gave, I think they gave, they gave an ultimatum talking about that they, you know, in light of COVID and everything going on about playing or not playing. And so what I was saying simply is that our college athletes aren't unionized other than I believe Northwestern tried to a little while ago. They don't have the same representation that we do in the NFL. We have a union that goes to bat for us, that um, negotiates the CBA, collective bargaining agreement, that and in, in the bargaining agreement, everything from, you know, the time that you can be on the field, to the length of, of the entire day, uh, to um, working conditions, all those things, workers' compensation, when you get injured, all those things are, are in the CBA. College players don't have that. And so what you're seeing from a lot of these college athletes is, hold on, um, you're saying, at least we're hearing, that we're in a public health crisis, uh, but you want us to go out there on the field with no protections. And so what they were doing as athletes was coming together and letting their voice be heard, realizing the power that they have, which is vastly different than when I was in college. Um, I don't think we realized the, the billions of dollars that are generated through specifically college football, but college sports in general. And when you talk about each school, what they are getting, it's difficult for them to give that up. Now, I'm not saying that those who are running these, these, um, these organizations or these leagues don't care about the kids. I, I don't know. I can't say that. But what I can say is that it is, I'm proud of the younger generation that is realizing the capital they produce and the power that they have in their talents to stand up and say, no, we're not doing this unless you give us these protections that we believe any person should have, especially in a public health crisis. Man, that is, uh, that's fantastic. I mean, you know, with the advent of, um, you know, these new players that just have such talent. And I guess, you know, the system has changed, you know, a lot over the years. Um, and Michaela certainly has given me a, a full education on, uh, you know, how much money, you know, some of these schools make and a lot of the decisions that are made. So it is encouraging to see a level of empowerment, uh, you know, taken by uh by young by young people um you know really for their for their futures and so uh it was very uh very unique man i appreciate that that perspective uh thank you uh michaela love you we're looking forward to you coming back to the east coast too um but uh i digress <laughs> um, i think we have continue, a, continue to get well michaela continue to get well keep pushing on you already know you've been through it before <laughs> We have uh, uh, Giovanni Patterson, actually, who uh, I want to bring up. He is actually a, uh, a member of the Frederick Douglass Foundation in Maryland. And uh, I should have really clarified beforehand whether or not he was a Ravens fan or not, or a, uh, I guess I can't say Redskins fan, I have to say <laughs> the, uh, the, the Washington football team fan. But we got, we got some of them, all, all of them on the line. But Giovanni, uh, why, don't you, uh, why don't you come up and uh, present your question for Ben? All right, good. Good evening, Ben. How you doing? Yeah, how are you? Doing well, doing well. Yeah, I am a Ravens fan, uh, so All you right. know, uh, hardcore. Not a season ticket holder, but uh, I do watch the game on whatever channel it's on every every week. So awesome. <laughs> um, so my question is, uh, given the fact that you are more uh, more vocal about family and social issues, um, what is the one impression you hope to leave on a locker room or any really in, really any space that you travel? Um, you know, you know, being, being that this was my last season and uh, retiring this year, you think a lot about that. And I think the word that describes for all of us would be legacy. So the question is, what do you want your legacy to be? And as an athlete, obviously, you want your legacy to be, you know, the great things you did on the field. That's what you committed your life to. And it's crazy how during my career, the times when God decided to elevate my voice had nothing to do with what I was doing <laughs> on the field. Um, Cause I was a good football player, but I wasn't great. I mean, I, I did my job, but you know, th there's, there's more to it. I think the reason why he kept me in the league for that amount of time was bigger than me. And so I wanted my legacy and I want my legacy to be number one, someone that stood for it, that had integrity, um, authenticity. A lot of people, um, 
don't have that and aren't concerned about that. And when you look at people that know you the best, they know if you're authentic or not. When you go into an NFL locker room and you're talking about Jesus and this and the other, they're going to know within five minutes if you're serious or not. And it's not that we don't make mistakes. It's just that we are honest about them and they continually see us striving to do what is right. We fall down, we get up, we're honest about it, we're welcoming, but we're challenging. I want guys to say in the league that have known me that, you know what, Ben, he, he gonna, he's going to tell me the truth. I may not like to hear it, but he's going to get on me when I've been dating this girl for 10 years and we got two babies and I ain't talking about marrying her. He's going to get in my face. He, <laughs> I've done that, and I see guys that are tweeting their, their wedding anniversary. I mean, because of the – I'm calling you to a higher standard, the same standard I will call myself to. I want my legacy to be, and I wanted it to be, someone who cared about justice and someone who was able to present and connect people um, to the issues that were important, but also someone who was able to engage with someone who did not think like me in a way that was respectful um, and, uh, and, and that, that promoted, promoted kindness, but also results. And so I've had those conversations in locker rooms. I, mean, I can remember talking to guys about you name it, religion, politics, all the stuff you're supposed to talk about, we talk about that in the locker room. But that's the legacy that I want to leave. And, and that's what I really what I, what I worked for and what I hope that guys who play with me and people in general who heard me speak outside of that, I hope that's what they, they got from me. Right on, man. Fantastic. Uh, I see Pastor Robert Jackson is uh, is on with us. Ben, you mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, and I think this is when I first learned about you, um, one of your earlier books, I believe, Under Our Skin uh, was the name. And uh, I think uh, Pastor Robert Jackson uh, wanted to ask, he's uh, down in Miami, uh, Florida. I've gotten to know him a little bit over the last few months. But uh, Pastor Jackson, why don't you uh, take that opportunity? I know that you had some questions regarding In That Space. Hey, uh, good evening. Um, good to see you tonight. Thank you, Dean. Um, Nelson, just had a question about the book. Um, what spawned the writing of, of your book? Um, it seems to be, um, it was almost written before its time. Uh, well, at least before these last couple of weeks, a <laughs> uh, couple of months. Uh, what, what spawned um, the writing of that book? Um, as you address the different things that took place in Ferguson and Charleston and I'm an AME pastor. So, um, I know well about Charleston. So, um, tell, could you, could you give us some insight to that? Yeah. Well, 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 you, you called it, um, it was Ferguson and the name, the name of the book is under our skin, um, getting real about race and getting free from the fears and frustrations that divide us. And it was released in, uh, 2015. And if you remember back to 2014, uh, was when there was the unrest in Ferguson, Ferguson, Missouri, with Michael Brown and Darren Wilson, the officer. Uh, there was a killing there. We didn't quite know what happened, but it was also on the heels of Eric Garner, uh, Tamir Rice. You go back another year, Trayvon Martin, the list goes on and on. And so there was this, there was this kind of fever pitch. And when this thing happened, it was like the powder keg went off. And I remember we were actually, I was, in, I was playing for the Saints, and we played the Ravens on a Monday night and got our head beaten. And if you don't know about Monday night football, it's super late, even in central time, it's late. So it's like midnight by the time you're getting home. And I remember getting, uh, coming out of the locker room and seeing my wife and she said they made a decision um, not to indict the officer. And I remember going home and staying up hours watching Fox and CNN and MSNBC and getting the news and seeing the images of people walking down the street. Many people were, were um, peaceful and other people weren't so peaceful. There was a mix, but everybody had a reaction to what happened because we were waiting months to hear if they were going to indict this officer. And so we played Monday night in the NFL, Tuesday is your day off. So if you play Monday, well, you only get in that one day off, especially if you play you know, Monday night and then, you know, you may, if you have an away game Monday night, you won't get home till six in the morning and that's your day off. And then you go right back in on Wednesday. So I stayed up and I was just having so much inside of me wanting to address this issue, but not really knowing what to say. And I wrote a Facebook post of all things. Didn't even know how to post to Facebook at the time. Had to call somebody and say, how do you post to Facebook? I don't even know how to do this. But I just wrote my emotions about being angry because 
it seems like the same stuff keeps on happening that my grandfather and my dad told me about. It's the same thing happening over and over again. I wrote about being sad because somebody lost their life. We need to be sad whenever there's a loss of life. I wrote about being introspective because even as we call out injustice and racism, we always have to be aware that we also hold prejudice inside of ourselves and address that as well. You know, I wrote about being sympathetic and about being encouraged finally because in spite of everything that needs to be addressed, that has been addressed, as a believer, you know that the gospel gives you hope. And so the gospel is what changes the heart of man. Now, there needs to be heart change, but there also needs to be policy change. We can do both, and we need to do both. We would not be free if it weren't for policy change. And so that needs to happen, but also, as believers, we address the heart. And so that turned into a book. <laughs> and so in the book, it's part memoir, but part uh, manifesto in really challenging Americans um, to address this racism issue head on with courage and to do it properly um, it, with, again, a biblical worldview. Um, and so that was several years ago. And then you look now, it seems like every five years we come back into this cycle. So what, hap well, what happened with George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and several others, now we're kind of back in that same place and people are starting to read the book again and be like, oh, I didn't know you had a book. Well, yeah, it's every five years. And so the question is, how do we move on from this place? How do we not keep coming back here? Because I know you're as tired of it as I am. So um, that's what the book was about. Um, and really encouraging black, white, in between believers, non-believers uh, to be engaged with this. And again, like I said before, a way that is honest, that is transparent, but also that is, is truth because we need to seek truth and justice. Wow, thank you, man. We uh, have a few more minutes, so we're going to uh, give one more question and then we'll have someone close in prayer. But I almost forgot, uh, we are doing some giveaways, Ben, of your book. So uh, Tori uh, uh, Snow from uh, our chapter president in Maryland wanted to do that. So uh, the, you can only really participate with this if you uh, can put something in the chat. So. The, uh, the question, the first question is, um, Frederick Douglass wrote three autobiographies uh, put into the chat, the first person that does the name of one of those autobiographies for a free book from Tory in the Frederick Douglass Foundation. So in the chat, the first person that puts in the name of one of Frederick Douglass's three books. And while they're doing that, we're going to pass it over to our young intern who's going to be able to ask the last question. Uh, Tori, if we could get Caleb uh, to uh, ask a question. We're trying to get Caleb Delgetti and if he, uh, He's got to be young. I know they can figure they can figure this out. If I can figure it out. <laughs> hello, hello. Yes, we can hear you. Hi, uh, how, how you doing? Doing great, man. Doing great. You have uh, you, one. You, this will be the last question. So uh, let everybody know that DLI does run an intern program. It's been a fantastic, pro fantastic process with this young man. But Caleb, the floor is yours. All right. So my my question to you is I would say what do you think at the um at the end of the day is how, or how, how have you seen like your main responsibility being a football player versus like saying anything else how, how do you think that platform specifically has um allowed you to share your message as opposed to to any other form of activism or how do you think that other people who um want to be involved in the sports can use that platform I, I asked also for my brother he really wants to be involved in uh, in football and, and athletics. He's uh, starting his freshman year of high school soon, but he's also really, really interested in just a lot of just what's going on in the world right now and just trying to just do what he, his part to make the world a better place also. So he, he's not here on the call, but what do you think there's one piece of advice I can sort of take to him for sort of just the interplay between those two desires? Yeah, thanks, Caleb. Um, you know, I think that we are all responsible for the influence that, that we have. Um, that could be your living room with your with your kids if you have kids. It could be your classroom if you're in high school or in college. Um, 
It could be your immediate friends, or it could be, you know, 100,000 Twitter followers. Whatever it is, we're responsible for our specific platform. God doesn't make you responsible for something that he hasn't placed under you. And you're only judged by how responsible you are to what he's given you at that time. And that can change because it's not about us. And so tell your friend and same for you, Caleb, um, as athletes, obviously there is a larger platform. And I think Charles Barkley said it so well, he's like, I ain't nobody's role model. And to an extent, I agree. Um, you don't have to be involved with everything, but you do need to be mindful that people are watching. You do need to be mindful that what you say carries weight. Um, you do need to be mindful that you represent um, an organization, your family, your God, um, and your country. If you're going outside of the country playing, you do need to be mindful of all those things. And so I, I think that, you know, being in the NFL obviously has given me um, more avenues. Um, but at the same time, uh, Caleb, no matter where you are, the Bible says, you know, you, you do it unto the Lord, not unto men. And so whether you are a librarian or whether you are a custodian or whether you are um, LeBron James in the NBA, uh, no matter what, or the president of the United States, you do it unto the Lord and he will make your name. He, he, he said promotions don't come from the east or the west, they come from the Lord. And he will elevate your voice and elevate your platform and elevate, um, you know, the things that you want to talk about. Um, if you do that at the proper time. So it doesn't matter where you are. The NFL obviously has been my kind of mission field for the last 16 years and really football for my, most of my, really all of my adult life, <laughs> plus some, uh, 20, 25 years involved with football. Um, so that's just been my avenue. Uh, but there are plenty other places to be involved. We're going to get ready to pray, Ben, but um, I'm going to, use my <clears throat> point of personal privilege before uh, the uh, vice chairman of the uh, Douglas Leadership Institute, Keith Frazier is on. And uh, I'm gonna say, I know you said that you need to go at 8.30. I want him to pray, but he has a question and you can tell him, I'm not gonna answer that question or you can answer that question. So Keith, <laughs> the floor is yours to pray and to ask your question whether or not uh, our distinguished guest wants to uh, respond to it. That is up to him. <laughs> I, I texted him. I texted him, Ben, and said, "You snip me. <laughs> you didn't give me a chance to ask my question. I'm gonna let it But no, listen, man. It it, it has been, uh, man. It's been a pleasure um, to be able to listen uh, and kind of watch from afar what. Um, you're doing and what God is doing through you, man. It's, it's really wonderful to see. And um, man, I thought I was doing with five kids, man. I mean, you've got seven. That's, uh, that's pretty serious. Uh, it is. But the, my, thing my, is though, I, the thing I, is, though, I, Keith, I, hey, we were at five. No, check that. We were at five. And then, and then we were like, okay, we got five. What should we do? I was like, well, I think I'm done. Are you done? I don't know. So you know how that goes. And then we're like, okay. Let's just go for the even number. Everybody will have a pal, even number six. <laughs> Identical twin boys. Like we skip, there's no, the twins are gotcha. do not run. Twins do not run in our family. Like this is not like, this was not expected. Like I go into, I go and look at the ultrasound. Right, I'm pretty good right. at looking at ultrasounds and I'm thinking what in the world is that? Twins. So be, I, I say all that to say, if you want to go for six, tread lightly, my friend. <laughs> Brother, I'm, I just I just want to say clearly, you have won the race. I, I congratulate you. I will step on the podium in second place. <laughs> well, listen, I I, uh, I will just simply say I'd, I'd love to kind of uh, uh, at some point. We don't have to do it now, but I I will take uh, uh, the I, I will extend the belief that I'll get a chance to talk with you at a later time. But I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about Colin Kaepernick and the decision that he made to take a stand uh, against pr police brutality the way he did it. I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. And then I'd also like to hear maybe one day about your thoughts of, I don't know if you kind of watched this NBA player uh, here recently that made the decision, a, a believer, um, uh, that made the decision to not stand uh, or kneel in solidarity with his team 
that was wearing the Black Lives Matter shirt and uh, hearing his responses and just kind of wanted to get your take on what you saw and how you saw that. So yeah. we can do well, it now or we can do it later. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say that, um, you know, my response to both is pretty much the same. We have a right to stand, kneel, sit, do jumping jacks during the national anthem. That's what this country is about. And so if Colin decides to kneel or if Jonathan decides to stand while everybody else is kneeling, um, I'm of the camp that says we respect their decision, we respect their humanity, and oh, by the way, let's find out why they decided to do what they decided to do. Let's not throw stones at them. Let's not call them names. Let's not tell them to get out of the country. Let's not tell them they're not black enough. Let's not tell them they're not American enough. Let's figure out why they decided to do what they wanted to do, consider it, and then move on. Um, so much of what we saw with Colin and with others like him who decided to take a knee um, has been asinine and has really been um, cruel and horrific when you see the things that have been said about them for simply exercising the constitutional right by people mainly who are standing. I've been in the NFL, like I said, 16 years, and I've looked around the stands during the national anthem, and people are on their phones, people are drinking beer, people are talking, and the same people want to say something about him, and they're acting a fool while the, while the national anthem is being played. And so, again, I think with both situations, we honor the agency of the individual because that's what we've been asking for on both sides of the equation. It's disingenuous and hypocritical for one side to say, well, you can't do that. And the other side to say, well, you shouldn't do that when they're asking for the same respect. So that's, that's, that's how I addressed it. I remember we, I was playing for the Ravens actually when, um, when, if you can remember in 2017, I believe, we were in London. Um, we were, so we were the first game of the Sunday. Because in London, you're obviously five hours ahead, so we were the first game. And that was the, the two days after President Trump said, if I see somebody kneeling, get that SOB off the field. And we had guys in the locker room. We had all that day on Saturday when we heard about it. We're in London. We're out of the country. And we heard our president, the person who represents us, say that about people like us, NFL players. And you had... You named the guy on the Baltimore Ravens from the top to the bottom. We were devastated. Guys were calling their parents. Guys were crying. We're going to Johnny Shelton, the chaplain. Like, what do we do? Like, we feel like we got to respond. And nobody had knelt up to that point. But then the response was mass kneelings across the, the league, in large part as a response to what the president said about those who were kneeling. Um, and so... You know, th this whole thing has, I think, become a lightning rod issue in our country. Um, but I think if we all took a step back and just saw it for what it is, saw the reasons why people decide to do what they do, understand that this is, there's more than one way to protest as well. I think that's what we saw with Jonathan, um, the basketball player. There's more than one way to protest. You can be someone who stands against injustice, that understands that Black Lives Matter, understand the importance of voting, of every other freedom that we've got, that we've had to fight for, and not feel like you have to kneel. And you can be someone who kneels and don't even think that, but they're just kneeling because they think that it's the right thing to do at the right time. It's very complicated. Um, those are my thoughts. I appreciate that. Thanks for the question. Fantastic. Well, Keith, if you can pray for us as we close, I want to say thank you to everybody who has been a part of this awesome conversation. Ben, thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, just for your dedication to the Lord and your commitment to serving others. Uh, just to let you guys know, it looks like that the first person who responded was uh, Janique Stewart, uh, who I believe got the, uh, the, uh, the correct answer. Uh, she mentioned uh, native of uh, actually, narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, which is correct. Someone also put my bondage and my freedom, which was also correct. Uh, so anyway, we just wanted to make sure, thank everybody for their participation. Uh, Keith, if you would pray us out, we'd be blessed. Thanks so much. Absolutely.
Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for just the opportunity that you have given us during this time, Lord, to reflect and reset um, kind of where we are and where we stand with you. Father, I thank you so much for Ben and your hand upon his life and his family and how you have enabled him to um, utilize the platform that you have given him to be able to speak truth to power, to speak truth to darkness, and to provide in a very gracious way insight, wisdom, and perspective that allows people to open up and to have a conversation. God, we just pray that you would continue to use him, use Dean, and use everyone that's on this call that had an appetite and an interest to hear more, to learn more, to gain perspective, to be able to use the wisdom that's gathered through these types of calls to be able to speak to the different spheres that you have put us in and given us an opportunity to speak to. I pray for your outpouring of wisdom, revelation, insight. I pray, Holy Spirit, that there would be a newfound commitment and dedication to you, trusting in you to lead and guide us into all truth, into the spheres that we're dealing with. And I thank you, Lord, for anointing us in such a way, God, that creates safe environments and causes people to desire to know what it is that makes us who we are. And Lord, I pray that you would be exuding from us in such a way that people would say, I'd wanna know the God that you serve. And so Lord, we thank you, we bless you, continue to be with us in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you all, have a fantastic evening. God bless you. All right, bye-bye.